Understandably, working remotely isn't for everyone. I think people that thrive in a remote environment are really driven on their own. They don't necessarily need the kind of external environment that you get in the office. I find that we are a lot more productive working remotely. We have, I think, some days it doesn't feel this way, but done a really good job of minimizing unnecessary meetings. And so we try to encourage focus time, like we have no meeting Fridays, where we just ask people, put your headphones on and do what you need to do so that you can get done and take a break. And on top of that, we don't have a commute. We don't have to, you can work your day around the schedule that works for you, as Stacey mentioned, kind of tapping into your energy levels. So you might, for me personally, six to 9 a.m. is my, my flow time. I wake up, I have my coffee, and I power through the most important things I have to do that day. And then I might take a little break, get some breakfast, go for a jog if I can, and then come back for meetings and the rest of the day. So you really have a lot of flexibility in, in the way that you kind of create your, your schedule, and that can be really nice. Welcome to Grow Think Tank. This is the one and only place where you will get insight from the founders and the CEOs of the fastest growing privately held companies. I am the host. My name is Gene Hammett. I help leaders and their teams navigate the defining moments of their growth. Are you ready to grow? The challenge of leading a remote culture is real. When you think about what it takes to create alignment and have the kind of culture that's collaborative and trust building and people are connecting with each other and, and getting work done, being productive, you want to make sure that you're doing this the right way. So we have on uh, here the company Just Drive Media with uh, co-founder Ali Winkle and then head of culture Stacy Clark. Uh, they talk about leading a remote culture and what they're doing. They were, you know, remote from the beginning, but they have 17 employees and they're doing some interesting things as it relates to how they are connecting together and how they are putting rituals inside of their work. And I think that if you are challenged with leading a remote culture, you want to do it better. This is the episode to lean into. My job is to help you become the leader that your company deserves and the one that your people are really craving. If you are not evolving as a leader, there's a problem. Your company won't scale unless you're willing to invest in yourself and work on yourself. Can you do it alone? Sometimes you can. But most of the work I've seen with people is not happening. It's blind spots. It's things that are, you know, you, you can't just read a book and it, you know, it all of a sudden takes care of itself because you don't know what book to read because you don't know what the real issue is. And if you're curious at all about the work of an executive coach, you want to connect with me, no pressure, just connecting about what's going on in your business, then go to genehammett.com and schedule a call today. All you have to do is, uh, you know, take that one initiative. We'll talk about your business. I've been doing this for 11 years. I thought about the other day, just 11 years. I know I can add value, some insight, wisdom, get, help you to create a plan. And all you have to do is take a chance. It's absolutely free. And if you are wanting to grow a fast growth company, you already are a fast growth company, then take that chance. I'd love to connect with you. I open up with Scott's on my calendar each week to be able to do this. So there's at least one per week. And if you want to make that happen, all you have to do is take a chance. Go to genehammett.com and schedule your call. Now, here's the interview with Ali and Stacy. Hello, how are you guys? Hey there, doing well, thanks. How are you? Great, hey. Ali and Stacy. We are going to have a great conversation about culture and in a remote environment. Before we get there, let's talk about your company, Just Drive Media. That's right. Yeah, we are a virtual agency. We've been around for about 16 years now. We do marketing, PR, and analytics across all of those. What is your specialty? I would say the analytics is kind of the foundation of all that we do. It is a bit more robust and detailed than what most traditional agencies do. So we look at we look at the everything that could be relevant to a client's communication strategy. So their overall perception that includes what people are saying about them on the web, what people are saying about them in social media, as well as traditional media. We combine all of that and use that data to inform their communication strategy, their product strategy, their business strategy, and how they react to changes in the market. Now, when I look on your website, I see a mixture of B2B, B2C. Is that right? Yes. We're primarily okay. focused on B2B, but we've done some consumer as well. Um I saw Instacart on there. That's one of my wife's favorite things. And she thinks it's one of the best inventions ever. It's a great product. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
before we dive into the culture aspect, and really that's what we focus on for the podcast, I'm curious, what do you wish business owners knew and understood about marketing that they just don't seem to get these days? That everything works together. Everything that I'm, I'm mentioning, having an integrated communications program is so much more powerful than having your PR team and your marketing team and your social media team work in silos. There are ways that you can build upon what each of those is doing together. And that's the best way to, to run a marketing program. Perfect. Stacey, we're going to give you a chance to chime in here because we're going to talk about your culture. You guys have 17 people or so, but you guys have been remote. Is that from the very, very beginning or just something you guys have uh, adopted? No, from the very beginning. I, Allie had, I think Allie had been in business for about a year and a half before I joined and we have been remote since day one. What do you find to be great about a remote culture? Because some people find it very challenging and I'm just going to go with the opposite. Uh, what's great about it? Oh, that is a great question. I'm sure Ali will have a lot to add here too. I, I mean, there's the obvious things like the flexibility, you know, the freedom to be able to work a little bit more with your energy levels or um, your time zone, because our team does cross multiple time zones. I do also think that our team feels very comfortable communicating online. You know, a lot of people are much more comfortable communicating their ideas in written form, like in Slack or Gchat or something like that. So I do think we have a really robust exchange of ideas and we're back and forth all day long where maybe you might not see that from people in an in-person environment. Yeah. Allie, would you add anything to that? <laughs> yeah, I mean... Understandably, working remotely isn't for everyone. I think people that thrive in a remote environment are really driven on their own. They don't necessarily need the kind of external environment that you get in an office. I find that we are a lot more productive working remotely. We have, I think, some days it doesn't feel this way, but done a really good job of minimizing unnecessary meetings. And so we try to encourage focus time, like we have no meeting Fridays where we just ask people, put your headphones on and do what you need to do so that you can get done and take a break. And on top of that, we don't have a commute. We don't have to, you can work your day around the schedule that works for you, as Stacey mentioned, kind of tapping into your energy levels. So you might, for me personally, six to 9 a.m. is my my flow time. I wake up, I have my coffee and I power through the most important things I have to do that day. And then I might take a little break, get some breakfast, go for a jog if I can, and then come back for meetings and the rest of the day. So you really have a lot of flexibility in the, in the way that you kind of create your, your schedule. And that can be really nice. Now we've been talking about focus time. Now, what we really mean by this is time to actually get the work done. It would be nice, right? To have time to get the work done. Tomorrow, I have write day. It's Friday. I'm writing a new book on leadership and I've got it blocked off. I have meetings later in the afternoon, but I'm really focused on writing. I wouldn't be able to get it done during the week. I wouldn't be able to squeeze it in between calls. Focus time really helps me get that alignment. I also believe that when you have these bigger chunks of time, you have a chance to be more creative and resourceful. You have a chance to, to think deeper about the, the challenges and solve problems in a different way than, than surface level. And sometimes it just takes that level of work. You want to see if you can get into flow state if you can. And that takes a, a bigger amount of time or some really intention around doing that. You're not going to fit it in 15 minutes between meetings, as I said earlier. That's my take on it. Hopefully you have this kind of structure inside your company. If you don't, I would consider you know introducing that. You can start slow. You can start with a half a day. You can start with a full day. Um, whatever works for you, but see if it works. Don't just exist in the way you've always done it. Make some changes and evolve. Back to this interview. Well, I've got to ask about this because I think a lot of people, you know, have this relationship with meetings that really makes it difficult. But you said you have no meeting Friday. It's for focus time. Get your work done. I had a client that went through this whole thing. The first time I offered it to them, they said, that's impossible. Um, <laughs> how long have you guys had it? And, and what is the impact of having this no meeting Friday? I think we've had it not that long, maybe six or eight months. And everyone was a little panicked at first. How are we going to do that? But I think having leadership behind them, letting them know we're all going to tell our clients together that we're not going to do client meetings on Friday, unless it's a really important meeting. 
And that gives us more time to focus and do great work for you. And clients have been really receptive. So we, we sometimes have found that internally, we are guilty of asking each other for like a one-on-one -on -one because that's the only time everyone's schedule is clear. But we've reminded ourselves to stay on top of that and give each other that time because we found it to be really valuable and the team has also. Yeah, I would add to that that a lot of people say about remote work that one of the things they like is that ability to get into kind of that flow state and tap into your creativity. And it is a big benefit of the way we work, because if we have a no meeting Friday, you can block out big chunks of time for projects that really demand your most creative thinking and just your most focus. And so that is one of the things I like about no meeting Friday the best. I've got meeting, I got writing time on Friday for me since I'm writing a new book. And so I can relate to what this means. And that means Thursdays are pretty difficult because <laughs> we're yeah. putting this on a Thursday. <laughs> I will say that I've already had 11 meetings and I have one more after this. <laughs> it's a lot, but I, I get the fact that you, it is a benefit It's part of that flexibility of a remote work culture. Um, how do you lead effectively in a remote work culture? Because it is a little bit different. You don't have a chance to drop by someone's work or see what they're doing or overhear things. So what about leadership inside of this remote work? It is different. We we operate in a way that I think we all kind of gravitate towards spending as little time as possible. I, I shouldn't say as little time as possible, but being able to get our work done as quickly as possible and not having a lot of fluff. So we're very efficient with our time. We try to be very direct and move things along quickly, communicate with as much information as possible as we are talking, whether that's in a one-on-one -on -one meeting or just going back and forth over Slack. And we have been doing that instant communication for a long time. When we first started, we used Skype, which was much more popular before Slack came along. So we were really used to, and a lot of our clients use Skype too. So we were really used to that instant communication kind of back and forth. And we have found that it allows for moving things along a little bit faster. But if there's any misunderstanding or any question whatsoever that feels like it's hard to determine or get through over instant messaging, we pick up the phone and, and talk. And so we try to make time to have one-on-ones regularly. We have larger team calls regularly where we inform everybody of what's going on with the company. Anytime that we can, we try to get together in person. We did we did a lot more of that pre-COVID. We would get together about once a quarter in the Bay Area where most of our clients are located, doing client visits, and then we would spend some extra time together. And we've done a few kind of company all hands offsites where we fly everybody out and we just spend a couple of days having fun together because it helps everybody get to know each other, have a good time and form bonds that you might not otherwise form over Slack or um, virtually. And one other thing I will say that I, I think is different for a company that is going remote or has a hybrid model, when you start off that way and you're kind of used to that way of communicating, we have found that people develop in ways closer bonds because they're more comfortable saying things over Slack or virtually than they sometimes are face-to-face. -face. And so we feel like we know each other really well. We have a super collaborative team and everybody works really well in that type of environment, but it takes a lot of coaching and encouragement to, to get there. Anything you want to add to that, Stacey? Yeah, I really like that last point Allie made about coaching. And I do think it also leadership becomes a little bit easier in a remote environment when you're very selective about who you hire. You know, you have to find people who can thrive in this kind of workplace. You're not going to see your team every day. You're not going to be able to look over the next cubicle. And especially if you're early in your career and hear how your manager is talking to someone. So we have to, we've gotten very buttoned up with our onboarding process, really thinking about what that looks like remotely and how to make sure anyone at any level really feels comfortable. They know what's expected of them. Everything is very clear. And then we've also dialed up things like coaching, you know, that side-by-side -side time for more junior team members who maybe need a little bit more understanding of like, this is how you're going to want to deliver news on a client call. Here are some things that we can work through together that are real life scenarios. So we've tried to add in some mentoring, some of that side-by-side -side work. We do the regular one-on-ones like Allie was mentioning and 
a lot of it is also from a leadership perspective over communication. We are all very, very heavy communicators because again, we don't see each other every day. So it's really important to make sure that everybody understands what you're working on and where you are in that process. So nobody's left wondering, nobody's left feeling isolated, and we can really do our best work that way. She mentioned be selective in hiring. I want to highlight this for a second. Your job is not to hire people that can do the work. You want to make sure there's a culture fit, there's a value alignment, and that they are the right people for the current people that you have. You want to make sure that they're going to align together. And if they are a skill fit, and they don't have these other things, you're going to be in for a lot of uh, friction, frustration, and a lot of different things that get in the way. My job is to help you understand that when you're selective in the hiring process, you will have a much better chance to find the right people for the team and you will grow maybe slower, but the right way. Back to the interview. Are you guys doing town halls or anything on a regular cadence or do you have any other rituals that, that really bring together the remote culture? We do. Sure. <laughs> we do all hands meetings. We try to do them on a monthly basis and we've played around with different formats. There's a lot of different things that we can discuss. Um, we've talked about having different team members present some of the things that they're working on, um, but it is a really good opportunity for everybody to get together and understand what are the priorities, how are we doing as a big, you know, as a business. And I would say that one of the things that I like best is how transparent leadership is about the business and really open with employees. So they feel like they're part of everything and they can kind of get on that bus. But we do a lot more things. We try to be very intentional about our culture, especially because if, you know, if you're thinking about somebody who maybe just started out in their career, they'd be meeting work friends, they'd have some of that interaction. And so we do a lot of things together that have helped us build some of that camaraderie, like trivia sessions and happy, you know, the things that you would expect like happy hours, but also yoga classes and cooking classes. We've done some really cool international cooking classes with our clients that everyone loves. Um, yeah, we've done a whole bunch of different things together that I think has helped the team get to know each other on a more personal level and kind of created some of that camaraderie that you don't necessarily get quite as easily as you would in an office environment. Are you guys getting together in person once a year? Or? We do. Absolutely. We do. We just recently in November, were able to meet down in the Florida Keys. We have met up in, we have a lot of clients on the West Coast. So we have done a few sessions out in the Bay Area, Lake Tahoe. Um, I'm trying to think of some others, Allie. I know we did maybe one or two more than that. So we've talked about a lot of the things that you guys are doing. What are some of the challenges you've overcome? Because there are specific challenges in a, in a remote work environment. What are they and, and what have you done to address them? Yeah, I think Stacey touched on some of them. I think one of the bigger challenges is, especially for people that are younger, newer in their careers, making sure that they're feeling like they're getting that kind of live time with the rest of the team is really important. And that's where she mentioned we started doing more sort of side by side working together. And we put a lot of time into the entire kind of onboarding practice. Um, we, you know, being shut down during COVID was obviously challenging for everyone. And in ways, I think we were better equipped because we were already remote, but we weren't all working from home with our kids and our spouses being home too. So, you know, it was, it was getting used to new things for everyone. And we had to kind of rethink, you know, how do we carve out more time and space for just ourselves and kind of getting away from some of those distractions and also we weren't able to get in person, get together in person as much. So that was when we really ramped up on a lot more of the virtual activities, doing some classes together. We did, uh, we have a book club and we do we read a book together and kind of chat through and talk about what we might be able to leverage from a, from a business perspective, what might be relevant for our clients. And we've done some that are a little more on a, on a personal level too. Um, we've asked people about, you know, their, their goals and aspirations outside of work, you know, what are some of their bucket list ideas for the next year or a few years. And we've talked through some of those things together that helps with that kind of personal bonding. Um, I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges is just that we aren't 
we aren't side by side, we aren't seeing each other in person all day long. And so making sure that we are deliberate about creating those shared experiences is, is really important. I guess we'll wrap up with that question. It's probably a little bit harder to answer, but Ali, your leadership has changed over the years as the team grows, as the markets are changing. Is there anything you can point your finger back to that has really helped you transform to be the leader that you are today? Absolutely. <laughs> um, you know, we did not set out to start an agency. My husband and I started this company thinking we will be lucky to bring in enough business to keep ourselves busy, essentially working as freelancers. And we were fortunate enough to have people start coming and asking us to support them right away and be able to start hiring. So for me, managing a team of people and especially a, a quickly growing team was a huge challenge. And while I'm always up for a good challenge, at sometimes there are times where it feels overwhelming, it feels intimidating. And I've also had some coaches along the way. Um, and I think experiences that have given more meaning to what I do. Um, I really enjoy the PR work and the marketing work and advising clients. But as a company grows, the CEO, the CEO's role becomes a little more about managing people than actually advising clients. I still get to do both, but the managing people piece was a, a big learning for me. So getting some of the right coaching, mentoring has been helpful for me and also helping find ways to inject more meaning in what we do as a company has been incredibly valuable for me. As an example, we were kind of we had some charitable um, donations that we had made really every year since we started, but that was initially kind of a personal thing that my husband and I were doing ourselves. And a couple of years ago, we decided, you know, we should open this up and make it more of a group activity because other people might feel the value that we feel out of doing that also. And so we ended up, we started by making donations to food banks and homeless shelters in the cities where each of our team members lives. Mm -hmm. And we expanded that and have done so much more since then. We actually put together a very ambitious goal of feeding 10 million people in the next 10 years. And that started a little over a year ago. We're at 350,000, a little over 350,000 meals so far. Um, and we have a plan for continuing to grow that. And what we have done is we donate a percentage of our profits, but also we've invited clients to participate as well in certain activities. We haven't asked clients for donations, um, but we invited them to our holiday party, for example, last year and the year before. And for everybody that joined, we made a donation to a food bank of their choice also. Um, and then we've participated in some events where a bigger company will match our donation and that has helped also. So we are continuing to pursue that path and look for ways to provide more meaning to the entire company around what we do and going beyond just the fact that we are aiming to provide an excellent service for our clients. Ali, Stacey, thank you for being here on the podcast, sharing your insights and wisdom. Of Absolutely. Thank you. Yes. Fantastic interview. Love the work that we're doing here. Hopefully you're learning how to lead a remote culture. Leading a remote culture takes a lot of intention. It takes a strong leadership. You have to learn to evolve. And my job is to help you become the leader that you want to be. You can keep listening to the podcast. That's the slow way. If you want me to help you, reach out. I'd love to support you. We have people and teams behind me. We do leadership development. We do executive coaching. If there's anything we can do for you, make sure you reach out. I'd love to help you. When you think of growth and you think of leadership, think of Growth Think Tank. As always, think of courage. We'll see you next time.